Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to the final program of our annual Clinton County Reads event. My name is Chris Owens. I'm the chairperson of the Clinton County Reads Committee and the director of the Blanchester Public Library. And the book we have read and discussed for this year's event is Race Against Time by Jerry Mitchell, in which the author describes his work as an investigative journalist in the South when he helped reopen several well-known unsolved murder cases from the civil rights era. So we are extremely pleased to wrap up this year's event with an evening with author Jerry Mitchell. Before I get into the introduction of Jerry, I would like to let everyone know if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the ch chat feature and we will address them at the end of the presentation. But Jerry Mitchell began working as a reporter at the Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi in 1986. He spent more than 30 years at the newspaper before founding the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting and leaving in January 2019 to run that organization. The nonprofit continues to do the important work of investigative reporting and makes all of its content freely available to newspapers across Mississippi. Jerry earned his bachelor's degree in communications from Harding University in Arkansas and a master's degree in journalism from The Ohio State University. He has won more than 20 national awards for his investigative reporting, including a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant and being named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. If you happen to read the paperback edition of Race Against Time, you may have noticed that there are several pages in the front filled with praise for Jerry's book. The one that stood out to me uh, may have also been the briefest one. David Goodman, who is the brother of one of the slain civil rights workers, Andrew Goodman, said the nation owes Jerry Mitchell a debt of gratitude. And I'm positive that everyone who has participated in Clinton County Reads this year feels the same way. So thank you, Jerry, for your work. And with that, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you. And let me, uh, let me share this and uh, we can get started. I appreciate, appreciate everybody reading my book. This is uh, quite the honor. I appreciate this, everyone reading. Um, but I want to tell, uh, talk about these cases and then we'll, as Chris mentioned, we'll open it up for questions. Um, but uh, this is the uh, poster, pardon me, the poster for the uh, three civil rights workers, the missing poster the FBI put out when they disappeared and they were missing for 44 days. And this, of course, Andy Goodman, Mickey Schreiner, who were from New York City and then came south to be part of the civil rights movement. And James Cheney, who's from Mississippi, is from Meridian, Mississippi. And not too long ago, I visited James Cheney's grave. And on the headstone, it has this phrase, there are those who are alive yet will never live, those who are dead yet will live forever. Great deeds inspire and encourage the living. And so I wanted to talk about some of those today, including Matt Grevers, who is the field secretary for the NAACP in Mississippi uh, from 1954 until, until its assassination in 1963. Um, uh, President Kennedy, of course, delivered his first civil rights speech um, on June 20, pardon me, June 11th, 1963. And that same night is when Mega Rivers was assassinated, shot in the back of his own driveway in Jackson. And uh, his wife and children, you know, went outside, saw the blood and screamed. And, and, and just horrific case in Jackson. Um, I don't know if you're like me, but if someone, well, so this is Byron D. Lebeck with the guy that was responsible. I don't know if you're like me, but if someone tells me I can't have something, I want it like a million times worse. So Mississippi had something called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, which was the state segregationist spy agency uh, that existed from the 1950s into the 1970s. And when the Mississippi legislature uh, officially did away with the organization, in 1977, they sealed all those records for 50 years. So when I found they had sealed those records for 50 years, my first thoughts was, well, there's something in there. They wouldn't be sealing the records. And uh, so I began to develop sources, began to leak me the files. What they showed at the same time, uh, Byron D. Lebeck with, uh, was being tried for the murder of Mega Rivers. This other arm of the state, the Sovereignty Commission, was secretly assisting the defense 
trying to get back with acquitted and nobody knew that. Um, there's, there's kind of a copy of kind of what their reports uh, look like. Uh, at the time that I wrote my story, the odds were literally, this was October 1st of 89, the odds were really more than a million to one against the case of being reopened or re-prosecuted. There was no evidence left in the vault. Uh, there was no transcript uh, in the court files. There was no murder weapon. I mean, everything was gone. But Merle Evers, the widow of Meg Evers, believed and she prayed and some amazing things happened. A couple of months later, Jackson police are cleaning out a closet and happened to find a box that contained crime scene photographs of the killing of Meg Evers, including a fingerprint, a Byron deal back with lifted from the murder weapon. A few months after that, Merle Evers shared with me her copy of the court transcript that she had saved in the safety deposit box. And a few months after that, uh, the prosecutor in the case found the murder weapon in his father-in-law's closet, which, you know, really did happen. <laughs> this is why I like nonfiction and uh, you can't make this stuff up. So I went to go interview uh, the assassin himself, uh, Byron D. Lebeck with, uh, you can probably figure out how I found this house uh, anyway, but this was in April uh, 1990 went to go interview him I spent about six hours talking to him absolutely the most racist person ever spent serious time with inward this inward that and then started in all the other non-white racists he was pretty much an equal opportunity racist and you know some people you talk to you feel like afterwards you need a bath and that was kind of what it felt like so you know, it was starting to get dark I felt like it was a good time to go he insists on like walking me out to the car and I'm like really that's okay. I think I can find my way. So he walked me out my, to my car and got me out there and says, if you write positive things about white Caucasian Christians, God will bless you. If you write negative things about white Caucasian Christians, God will punish you. If God does not punish you directly, several individuals will do it for him. And so his wife and made me a sandwich. I think you can guess what I, I did with a sandwich. So at the time I went and interviewed Beckwith, he had no idea. I wrote the story that got the case reopened. By now, after he's months later arrested, brought back to Mississippi, he's figured it out. So he saw me across the courtroom and said, you see that boy over there? When he dies, he's going to Africa. And I turned to a friend of mine and went, you know, I always wanted to go to Africa. So Byron D. Beckwith was convicted of the murder of Mega Rivers. And when the word guilty rang out, this is February 5th of 1994, you could hear the waves of joy as they cascaded down the hall till it reached a four year full of people black and white just erupted in cheers. And Merle Everson, and her daughter, Rena, cheered as well. Um, the, the next case I got involved with was after Byron D. LeBecker got and died, I was this family reached out to me. This is Ellie Damer. She's holding a photograph of her husband, Vernon Damer, who's a farmer, businessman, NAACP leader, believed in voting rights, fought for that, and the Klan didn't like that, so attacked him and his family in the middle of the night, January 10th, 1966, firebombed their house, you know, obviously set it on fire, began firing their guns into the house. Vernon Damer woke up, grabbed a shotgun, ran to the front of the house, began firing them back at the Klansman um, while his family escaped safely out back window. Unfortunately, the flames of the fire seared his lungs and he died later that day. A few weeks later in the mail came his photo registration card. He fought his whole life for the right of all Americans to be able to have never been able to cast a ballot himself. Um, and Vernon Damer had uh, four sons at the time in the military at the time of the attack on him and his family. And actually six of his seven sons served a total of 78 years in, um, in the military. And this is the photograph of them when they uh, came home. Uh, to, you know, what, what was their family home? And uh, anyway, uh, the guy who ordered the killing was this guy. His name is Sam Bowers, the head of the White Knights, the KKK like the response for at least 10 killings we know in Mississippi. So Bowers has been tried in this case and never been convicted. So after the Vernon Damer family met with me, they met with the district attorney who acted interested, but then pretty quickly got cold feet. 
then he didn't then he left office another da came in and he acted even less interested so i i got an opportunity to get my master's at ohio state so i'm literally in ohio in the spring of 1997 when i get this telephone call from this guy who wanted to meet uh and it turns out he used to work for bowers and had overheard bowers give the orders to kill vernon Daimler. so after he met with us he met with the district attorney's office the cases reopened in earnest the guy who'd been the key witness back in the 1960s was this guy. His name was Billy Roy Pitts. Billy Roy Pitts was involved in the killing of Vernon Damer, dropped his gun, got caught, plead guilty of murder, got a life sentence for that, plead guilty to a federal charge, and got five years for that. So I was researching how much time he actually got, because uh, several of these guys, it was a bit of a joke. They got pardoned by the governor, et cetera. So I couldn't ever find a record of his state time. And what I was told was he went into the Federal Witness Protection Program. So I was researching this. I called the Federal Bureau of Prisons to find out how much time he he did. And so I'm talking to this archivist in Washington. I said, now, how much of that five-year prison, you know, sentence that he got did he actually serve? He said, she said three and a half years. And I said, well, I understand he left. Uh, federal prison and went in the witness protection program and the archivist said that's impossible I said what are you talking about so there was no federal witness protection program back then so what this meant was Bill Roy Pitts had never served a single day of his life sentence kind of a big oversight right so um so I didn't know if this guy was alive or dead or where he lived and so this is a relatively early days of the internet there was a website I knew where you could type in somebody's name and you didn't have to have the city or state like, like the rest of them. You could just type it in and take your chances. So did it, up it popped. Billboard Pitts had his address, Dem Springs, Louisiana, had his telephone number. First 20 minutes of the conversation went like this. How'd you find me? How'd you find me? I'm like, well, it's on the internet. He's like, the internet, I can list a telephone number. So the result of my story that he had he never served a day of his life sentence. Mississippi authorities issued a warrant for his arrest. Um, he didn't like that. <laughs> in fact, he ran. And while he was on the run, he sent me this audio cassette. When I got it, I played it, and this is how it began. Jerry, I just thought I'd let you know you've ruined my life. But I promise I've talked to anybody. I've talked to you. So here's this tape. And on this tape, he proceeds to tell me all of his involvement, killing Vernon Damer, all about his involvement in all this other clan violence. So shortly after this, he turned himself into authorities, and this now leads to the arrest of Sam Bowers. Also arrested, this is May of 1998, is uh, his right-hand guy. His name is Devers Nix. And when the family brought Devers Nix in, it was like the most pitiful sight you've ever seen. It was like wheeled him into the wheelchair with the oxygen tank, brought him up in front of the judge, and he's like, I can't take more than a couple steps without needing oxygen, Judge. And Judge is like, well, I normally don't do this, but I'm going to let you out without bond. A dozen days later, this is like a reporter's dream. This is where we caught him playing golf. And uh, so um, so he got arrested. <laughs> yeah, he loved me. Uh, so fast forward, Sam Bowers goes on trial in August of 1998 and guess who's there to testify uh, on Sam Bowers' behalf, but his right-hand guy, Devers Nix. Uh, and so his lawyer was a really good criminal defense lawyer back in the 1960s. But by now this guy's in his eighties and that's perfectly fine. But I think the other details should know is they actually brought him from the nursing home to the courtroom. Uh, and so he's, the lawyer's trying to work out a signaling system with his client here. He's like, now, Devers, when you get up there, if you need to take the fifth, the fifth being the self right against self-incrimination, right? If you need to take the fifth, I'm going to raise my hand. So Devers like, okay, okay. So I looked over, so he gets up, starts testifying. I looked over his lawyer about five minutes later. His lawyer's like, <laughs> you know, fast asleep. So Devers kept right on testifying. Yeah, I was in the Klan. And he tried to put a positive spin on it like there is one. Well, the Klan was a benevolent organization passing out fruit baskets to the needy at Christmas. And under cross-examination, a prosecutor got and said, Mr. Nix, just how many fruit baskets did you pass out? And Devers says, oh, 
sad to say, none. I swear it was the funniest trial I ever covered in my life as a reporter. Deadly serious matter, a funny trial. The guy who represented Sam Bowers was this guy on the right. His name is uh, Travis Buckley. And Travis Buckley was not just a, a um, lawyer for the Klan. He was a leader in the Klan itself. He's actually indicted for this firebombing at one point. Uh, never convicted, but indicted for it. And so um, Bill Rapist is kind of laying out, you know, all the details of what the prosecution is having him do this. But he's mentioning this planning meeting took place prior to the attack on Vernon Damer and his family. So he's like laying it out. It's like, I was there. Sam Bowers was there. Devers Nix was there. Travis Buckley was there. And yeah, I looked over. I looked over at Buckley and no, no, no response. And so the court reporter was, what were those names again? The court reporter. And so Bill Roy Pitts repeats the whole list again. You know, Billy Roy Pitts, Sam Bowers, Devers Nix, Travis Buckley. Now Buckley shoots up like a rocket. Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, I've, I've covered a lot of trials in my life. The only trial I ever covered where a witness implicated the defense lawyer himself. Um, so Sam Bowers was convicted August 21st, 1998, and sentenced to life in prison, just like Byron D. Lebeck with. Um, the next case I got involved with just kind of accidentally, we just started writing. My editors wanted me to kind of write about what other cases were out there. And this was one of them, which is the Birmingham church bombing that killed these four beautiful girls and, and blinded a fifth, uh, Sarah Collins as well. And so one of the last living suspects was this guy, his name is Bobby Cherry. And so I talked to him briefly over the phone uh, in 98, uh, toward the end of 98. And then his wife emailed me months later and said, Bobby wants to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. So I drove over. It turns out he lived near Tyler, Texas, which is not far from where I grew up, which is the schizophrenic town of Texarkana. So I knew where he lived. So I... So I drove over to Texas, met him and his wife, took him out for barbecue because I guess that's what you take Klansmen out for. I'm not really sure, but we ate barbecue. We talked. He's like, I didn't have anything to do with that church bombing. I left that sign shop. The sign shop is just literally two blocks from the church. It's also where the Klan made the bomb. He says, I left that sign shop at a quarter to 10 because I had to get home and watch wrestling. He pulled out this sworn statement from this woman. Yes, I remember that night. We were all sitting around watching wrestling. So, um, you know, one of the rules in journalism, this is the way we say it in the South, uh, even if your mama tells you she loves you, check it out. And so the next day I'm in the newsroom and go up to our librarian, Susan Garcia, and say, Susan, just check with the Birmingham News and see what was on TV that night. Because I remember from when I was a kid, you know, the entire television schedule was in a pretty small box in the newspaper. And she came back to me the next day and told me there was no wrestling. And so Bobby Cherry was arrested in that case. I had also heard that Bobby Cherry had something to do with the beating of Fred Shuttlesworth, who was a civil rights leader in Birmingham. He was actually the one that invited Dr. King to Birmingham. You know, all the you've seen the photographs and video of the dogs and the fire hoses and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that was all in Birmingham in the spring of 63. And uh, anyway, uh, Fred Shuttlesworth, Reverend Shuttlesworth was the one who invited Dr. King in uh, to do that. Um, so anyway, I, have Bob, I heard Bobby Cherry something to do with the beating of Fred Shuttlesworth in 1957, which is when he took his two daughters to try and enroll them at the all-white public school in Birmingham. And of course, this was in the wake of Brown versus Board of Education, which supposedly opened the door for all this. But he showed up determined to get his kids in school. And uh, there was there was a white mob that basically showed him showed up and and and, and beat him. So I asked Bobby Cherry about this when I interviewed him and he, he denied it. And so. Um, so fast forward, one day in the mail, I get this big, thick biography of Fred Shuttlesworth. And I don't know if you're like me, but the first thing I do when I get a big, thick biography, look at the pictures. Yeah, so I was looking at the pictures, and there's a picture of the beating Fred Shuttlesworth. 
And so I really couldn't make anybody out in any of the photos, real distant shots. So I contacted the author and said, hey, are there any other pictures of the beating in French Charles where it's out? There's footage of it. I'm like, you're kidding. So he pointed this old CBS documentary, which I was, which then I got a hold of CBS, which then sent me a copy of the documentary. And this is a, just a frame of it, uh, just kind of give you a picture of it, give you an idea of what it looked like. Um, here was my problem. I had no idea what Bobby Cherry looked like in 1957. I knew what he looked like back, you know, now, but I didn't know what he looked like in 57. So I contacted his son, who's a truck driver, kind of semi strange from his dad. Uh, his dad didn't have anything nice to say about him on my dad when I interviewed him. Uh, so I contacted Tom and said, hey, would you mind coming by and look at this footage? He's like, yeah, sure. So he came by and I played the footage for him. He's like, yep, there's dad. If you see the guy that's uh, to the right with the cigarette sticking out of his mouth and the white shirt, that's Bobby Cherry. He identified him and said, here's dad. And he even pointed out something I didn't see. He said, yeah, you see him reaching his right front pocket. That's where he kept his brass knuckles. And sure enough, you can see him hit uh, Fred Shortsworth with the brass knuckles and he wound up with a concussion. His wife was stabbed. Uh, one of his daughters had her ankles broken uh, in the attack. So a very vicious attack. Uh, and this is, by the way, this is also in Spike Lee's documentary, uh, if you ever see uh, Four Little Girls. So when Bobby Cherry went on trial, they showed this footage of, um, of, of Bobby Cherry beating Fred Shellsworth and they introduced the television blogs to show there was no wrestling. And Bobby Cherry was convicted and given four life sentences, one for each one of those girls. Um, remember, what I, remember what I told you before about if someone tells me I can't have something, I want it like a million times worse. Well, Sam Bowers, who never ever gave interviews, gave an interview to the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And it was sealed though till he was dead. And so obviously once again, I'm like, I want to get a copy of that. So I developed source who, who uh, it was somebody from the attorney general's office who got, they already had a copy of it and they let me come read it. And so I read it and in this interview, Bowers talked about what we called, what I mentioned at the beginning, it's sometimes called the Mississippi burning case, the three civil rights workers that were killed by the Klan and their bodies buried 15 feet down. And so, um, anyway, Bowers was um, talking about that, and he was one of seven Klansmen that were convicted on federal conspiracy charges, okay? Nobody ever been prosecuted for murder. Federal conspiracy charges, and the rest, the rest of the 18 Klansmen walked. So Bowers, in, in, in this interview, said he was quite delighted to be convicted and have the main instigator of the entire fair walk out of the courtroom of a free man. And he was referring to this guy's name as uh, Edgar Ray Killen. Uh, Edgar Ray Killen was, you know, um, basically the organizer, orchestrator, I guess you could say, of this of this this series, this event. And so um, I reached out to him, you know, and you know, we talked for quite a while. Finally, at some point, he said, "There's some guy in Jackson just keeps stirring things up and stirring things up and stirring things up." And I just didn't have the heart to tell him it was me. So I took him and, him and his wife out for catfish, <laughs> lake feeding them Klansmen. So um, we went out, and I asked him if he had anything to do with the killing of the three civil rights workers. He said, "No." I said, "What do you think should happen to people who were responsible?" He said. I'm not going to say they were wrong. And then he proceeded to tell me this story. When um, Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis at that moment in time, the you know, FBI had no idea who, who did it. So they sent out, you know, basically agents everywhere. Two of them show up at the doorstep of Preacher Killen, as he's called locally, Preacher Killen. Um, he wouldn't talk to him, but the agent left his card. Time goes on. One day, Preacher Killen picks up the card, calls the agent, wants to know who killed King. And the agent's like, why do you want to know? And Killen says, man, I want to shake his hand. You know, sometimes people see these guys go off the trial or go off to prison. And they'll say to me, Jerry, why don't you leave these old men alone? And you know what I tell them? These were young killers. They just happened to get old. 
Ed Gray Kiln was convicted on the exact anniversary of these killings, June 21st in 2005. And this is what he was responsible for, orchestrating the killing of these young men and their bodies buried 15 feet down. To date now, there have been uh, 24 convictions in these uh, civil rights murders. And it's a matter of faith with me. I'm a person of faith. And uh, I do believe God's hand has been involved in these cases and these convictions. But the most amazing thing I've witnessed has actually not been some of the convictions. It's been some of the racial reconciliation. Um, not too long after uh, Sam Bowers was convicted, Bill Roy uh, Pitt's testifying hearing when he got done, he walked to the back of the courtroom and ran into Mrs. Damer. And Billy Roy Pitts apologized to Mrs. Damer and asked her to forgive him for killing her husband. And she forgave him. She began to cry. He began to cry. And as I walked out of the courtroom that day, I thought about Vernon Damer and others who lived lives that matter. And I thought about James Cheney's headstone, you know, that saying, there are those who are alive yet will never live, those who are dead yet will live forever. In that moment, it, it dawned on me, each day we are etching the words of our headstone with our lives. What do you want your headstone to say? Um, Thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, I have a few quick, I guess, commercials, you want to call them. Um, one is, uh, I'm grateful you did race, you got, you read Race Against Time, which is fantastic. And if you have any questions, obviously I'll answer those at this time. Uh, I did want to mention, uh, which Chris was kind enough to mention, our nonprofit. Uh, we have um, two of our investigations, uh, investigative series so far have already re resulted in Justice Department investigations, one into the prisons in Mississippi and one into a very uh, similar case to kind of George Floyd, uh, which it turns out this guy, not only did this guy die at the hands of police, but um, it turned out his mother uh, died in that same jail 13 years earlier and she was hogtied by police and she died as well. So it's um, so we're 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 busy and we're working on uh, a documentary. Uh, in fact, we've got a documentary starting to shoot tomorrow. So uh, we're, we're involved in a lot of projects. And this is my contact info. You're welcome to reach out to me. Um, it's my email. Each day on Facebook and Twitter, I kind of post this day in civil rights history. So if you're like me and you love history. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a, a means by which you can learn more and you can share it with others as well. And it's uh, it's very fascinating. We, it, what's real fascinating on the Facebook side of this is we consistently have people who have some kind of connection uh, to these events. Uh, you know, people who say, "Well, that was my grandfather," or, or "That was my mother," or whatever. You know, whatever the situation, or "That was me." You know, I was involved in that protest. So it's always uh, leads to some very interesting discussions as well. And I think that's it. I will uh, turn turn the uh, turn it back over to uh, to uh, everybody everybody who's in charge. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jerry. One one of the first questions I wanted to ask you: We had a uh, viewing of the film Ghosts of Mississippi here at the Murphy Theater in Wilmington last week, and you, of course, were one of the characters in that movie. But I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that movie. You didn't really mention that much in the book at all, but yeah, I didn't really talk about it in my in my book. I you know I've written about it. I mean, I have this you know I kind of. You know, I wrote way more than that. My, my book was originally twice as long. I know that's hard to believe, but yeah, a lot of it, it happened over 16 year span. So that's not probably that surprising. Um, obviously it's told from the prosecutor's perspective. Uh, and so it's really his story rather than maybe my story or Merle Evers story or Mega Evers story. I think that's the one thing, if I could improve it, I guess you could say, would be to tell more about Meg Revers 
And, uh, and I had such a quick talk, I, you know, 30 minutes, I, I wish I, I probably should have included more about Megger, but I'll mention it now. Uh, Megger Evers was a World War II veteran. He fought in Normandy, for example. Um, he was involved in early, he was involved in the civil rights movement before what we kind of termed the modern civil rights movement. He got involved when he came back. He was among the, the many black veterans who returned after fighting the Nazis to uh, in the South to basically fighting racism all over again in the form of Jim Crow that barred African-Americans from restaurants and restrooms and voting booths, obviously. So um, they're, you know, incredible guy. And so I, th that's my one wish. I wish there had been more about Megger Evers in the film and, and Merle Evers too. So, yeah. I thought it was interesting. I don't know if you have any both Bobby DeLotter and Ed Peter sort of ran into legal problems later on. Well, that's true. Any thoughts, yeah. Any thoughts about that? Or wow. I know you've written articles about it. I have written articles about <laughs> it. I, it was the, this is, this is why I say in reporting you, you, there's no such thing as having friends in journalism because <laughs> I found myself, you know, and I, I, you know, Bobby and I had our ups and downs and you can see that in the book, but, um, we had been fine after the conviction. I mean, we got along fine after that. And um, I found myself having to call Bobby DeLauder and saying, hey, I heard Ed Peters got a million dollar, you know, basically million dollars from this case. And he swore and said it wasn't true. And it turned out it was true, <laughs> you know. So um, Ed Peters was the one who went to the courthouse first. This is unfortunately uh common in our judicial system i don't know that's always a good thing well i'd say probably most of the time it's not a good thing but he was the first one to cooperate with the feds and so he didn't get prosecuted uh, but bobby delauder got prosecuted for lying to an fbi agent because he denied he had had much of any contact with ed it was this was a civil case that bobby was deciding involved yeah involved it's a whole long story but anyway involved millions in legal fees essentially and um and so he he ruled in this case and so um he didn't get prosecuted for for a bribe i mean that, the 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 allegation was the bribe was a federal judgeship or the promise of you know being recommended for a federal judgeship which he wanted but they actually um the only thing what he pleaded guilty to was lying to an FBI agent, which he admitted he did. So it's sad. I mean, I I really, you know, in terms of Bobby as a person, I really appreciate and admire Bobby, and and, and none of this takes any anything away from him and my in my personal estimation of him. I, I still appreciate and admire him. Yeah, I think it's a unfortunate. Yeah. Gotcha. Ed um, Peters, I would not say the same thing about. <laughs> Ed Peters is a whole nother story. <laughs> one of the questions that came up during uh, one of our book discussions here was, why did you wait so long to write the book? Um, or how, how did the book come about, I guess? Well, it's not, it, it wasn't by choice. Uh, it wasn't like a my end I was, I was trying to delay. There were, there were, <laughs> several factors involved i try you know i sort of I, I had a book deal that fell through right after the mega rivers case but i'm grateful i didn't write it because i really to be honest i couldn't have i I, don't, I wouldn't have done well um they had these other cases and so i didn't get i got the macarthur is what let me get a book deal uh because when i got the macarthur um suddenly you know i you know, I don't, I don't mean this braggingly, but suddenly I've got my picture on the front page of the New York Times. And I purposely said to the guy writing the story, please mention I'm writing a book. <laughs> so the next thing I know, I'm getting calls from publishers. You know what I mean? Like, you know, all of a sudden I'm getting calls from publishers. So I was in New York. Um, what I was in New York for is, is, is kind of funny. I got invited because, because I wanted it. 
I got invited on Stephen Colbert's show. So I was, I literally went to New York for the Colbert show. Mm -hmm. And while I was in New York, I met with all these publishers and we got, we got a deal. So, um, but then the original, so I would have written it long then, but there ended up being this debate about how to approach the book. They, my publisher learned it to be more like half history, half memoir. And uh, I tried to do that. And, and initially, I think the Megger chapter worked fine, but then the other ones didn't work as well. And uh, anyway, and, and so eventually they eventually agreed with me. Uh, I worked with another editor um, who came in and he was great, uh, John Cox. And so they let me finally write as a straight memoir. I wrote the first draft in a year. Um, again, it was twice as long as it should have been. So, and then it took us, um, you know, then we had to edit it, you know, it first had to cut it back. I probably, I probably took me another year between him and me, uh, kind of cutting it back. I, I did most of the cuts, but, um, and then you had to shape it and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't until 2015 or something like that, that we had a first draft. So I, I, that's pretty quick. I mean, uh, maybe it took longer to edit than maybe we could have done that quicker, but I'm, I'm very pleased with the final, final, you know, I wish we'd, be, we'd done it sooner. I wish we'd done 2005, you know, yeah. uh, it would have been, you know, fresher, obviously. So um, Another topic that came up in book discussions was that uh, I think the consensus was you were probably in a little more danger than you let on at certain points. Is that, is that true or did yeah you... i didn't i didn't want to i you know i didn't feel any need to you know i didn't I, you know well two things one is i tried in my best way even though it is a memoir and therefore it's from my point of view etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. i tried my character to be as much as i could a lens where you can kind of your the focus obviously is the families and what they went through and, and things like that uh, but obviously following me too on kind of this uh, journalism journey of, of pe or, you know, detective, kind of a detective story of piecing the case together as well. But I don't know, I, I didn't want to spend too much time focusing on that. I mean, I've gotten dozens of death threats and I could have, I could have written about all of them, you know, but I, I didn't really see the need to, I thought, I think, you know, just give people flavor for that rather than trying to you know, beat them over the head with it. I think there's several things like that that my editor and I discussed and 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 kind of decided, hey, let's, uh, you know, we don't, this is enough. You know, we don't we don't need to repeat it. So yeah, you are correct though. I had far more death threats. <laughs> Were you ever surprised that some of these guys kept talking to you or would oh, talk yeah. to you even? I'm surprised every time, you know, I couldn't believe they, they talked to me and like Bobby Sherry invited me to come talk to him. So yeah, it, it's crazy. But as I mentioned in the book, you know, Beckwith had a quiz I had to pass before I went and talked to him. Uh, so, you know, and I, I could refuse to answer, but I knew he'd love my answer. So why not just tell the <laughs> truth, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, a question we had here tonight is who wasn't brought to justice? I think you mentioned in the later in the book that you failed many more times than you succeeded, but yeah, yeah. I worked on a bunch of other cases. Uh the Emmett Till case is probably, I guess, the most well known of those cases. Um yeah, and then D and Moore case, I, I worked some on and then they kind of reopened it later and prosecuted that, which I was grateful to see. Um I'd initially done some stories on that and they reopened the case, but then they didn't do anything and just kind of sat there. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm always going to say that. I mean, I feel like I failed far more than I succeeded, but that's the, you know, these cases are, are very difficult. Every single one of them I think is difficult. And uh, I felt like every single one of them was a miracle. You know, it, it was the, the odds were so high against and almost every one of these cases uh, against the case ever being re-prosecuted period. And uh, so it was really incredible. I have another question here from someone here. Um, it says, I have a nonprofit that participates in civil society discussions with the State Department to implement the Human Rights Treaty known as the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. 
would you be interested in participating in those discussions? Uh, yeah, email me and I'm happy to, uh, in fact, I'll stick my email up here in the chat if people want to. Okay, I'll um, just tell, tell them to contact you. Yeah, that'd be fine. Just have them reach out to me. Uh, I don't know if you see that there's a comment in the chat there more than I see that about if you the, want if you want to the, comment on that or. Yeah, he's talking about, you know, black. Uh, what I'll just read the quote. Uh, I think the book is very timely in light of the Black Lives Matter movement and attempts at voter suppression we're seeing uh, in several state legislatures made me realize how much has changed, but how much hasn't changed. It's very true. I mean, it seems like with race relations in this country, we we take a step or two forward and then a step or two back. It's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. And the other part is, and I say this in the, the paperback, uh, the afterword in the paperback, which is, um, and Merle ever said it and when I talked to her, but we keep repeating our history because we don't know our history. And it's so true. You know, there's so much of history of just being a cycle. And, and that's what's happening right now. There's, uh, uh, I just finished a book I was listening to about, you know, some of these issues. And, and historically, I mean, these things just kind of come back around. You know, there was a, we don't know, a lot of people don't know the history of like reconstruction and things like that. And, uh, and the response to black voting and what was the response to black voting during, you know, with reconstruction. I mean, there's like violence and fraud and, you know, attempting to basically what they, they for initially react with violence and fraud. And once the whites regained power in places like Mississippi, then they made it legal through the 1890 constitution, which then the other Southern states copied, um, to basically disenfranchise African-Americans. And, and therefore, and now all of a sudden, you know, you would think most Americans would agree voting is a good thing and we want more people to vote, not less. And yeah. now all of a sudden it's gotten hyper-partisan about this, about, wait a minute, I'm not sure we want everybody voting. It's like, okay <laughs> it's just very fascinating you, you uh, i'm giving that mississippi is an example on this voting absentee in mississippi you would not believe how difficult it is and this is before all this other stuff happened you know more, most recent kind of rounds of you know restricting voting in some way but the being able to vote absentee in mississippi it's almost like an act of Congress. I mean, you, you have to have an, you have to have a sworn affidavit, you know, to be able to apply for, like, you have to have it notarized, you know, basically be able to apply and you have to have a notary public involved at both steps to be able to get a ballot and then to be able to vote. And you have to do this all by mail. It's insanity. It's absolute insanity. And if you look at the instructions, it is the most confusing instructions. And I've heard from clerks before they say, they, they're, they're, people are, you know, call, like they honestly want to be able to vote absentee. They're going to be out of town or whatever the situation is. And they can't, you know, these are people with you know, master's degrees and they can't even figure out how to vote absentee in Mississippi. That's how tough it is. So it's just ridiculous. It's, uh, anyway, yeah, unfortunately these things are, uh, come back around. It, it's, and it's, on, it's, on the opposite end, I think I saw an interview with you where you said to be a coroner in Mississippi, yeah. you have to have what, just a high school, be a high school graduate, I think. You don't even, yeah, GED. Oh, GED. <laughs> That yeah, we, we, we aim high. We aim high here. <laughs> 21 in GED. It's it's just incredible. Um, yeah, and so we're looking at the death investigation system, and obviously coroners are part of that. So yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's any chance you might we might see a movie of race based on race against time at some point? Yeah, I I've had some Hollywood interest actually. A couple different production companies have been interested in turning it into like a limited TV series. Oh, okay. Is everybody, 
everybody think it'd make a good TV. TV oh, I think it'd be uh, great. Yeah, TV series. I I think it's more suited for that than a feature because um, for obvious reasons, it's it, it's uh, it, you you can have you know several episodes on each each case as opposed to. If you did a feature, you'd have to just break off one case. You couldn't yeah. do all the cases. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I have one more question here. Do you have any good book recommendations? Oh, it depends on what kind of books you want. Um, I, I, you know, just did one the other day for, I was talking to people. If you're talking about nonfiction, uh, in fact, I've just got a list I was, I just just came up with the other day for people who were asking me, um, you know, like books that are really, at least in my mind, they're just exceptional examples of like nonfiction, yeah. um, like um, Hiroshima by John Hersey, uh, which was originally a New Yorker piece, is excellent. In fact, there's a book that just got written within recent years about the writing of that piece. Uh, which is good as well. Um, I'm a big fan of memoir. I love memoir. Uh, so Angel's Ashes by Frank McCord, I think it's excellent. Um, Liars Club by Mary Carr. Uh, Brent Staples kind of wrote the series of essays, which is also autobiographical, called Parallel Time. It's really good. Um, uh, Primo Levy wrote, wrote a memoir. Uh, he was in, in Auschwitz. Uh, so it's called Survival at Auschwitz. Um, and, uh, and then, and then uh, uh, Pilgrim on Tink at Tinker's Creek, Pilgrim on Tinker's Creek, that's what the name of it is, by Annie Dillard. Anything to Annie Dillard writes is fantastic. And Ian Frazier did this one called Great Plains. I, I could list a ton. But it, those are good examples of like what I consider well-written uh, nonfiction. Do you see that uh, in the chat there? Oh, yeah, let me... Something sorry, about another Miss, thing up here. Mississippi Burning Trilogy. Yeah, I had to check out, yeah, had to check out Greg's book. Yeah, I know Greg. And, uh, yeah, no, the, 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 the reporter in the book, in Greg's book, is based on a Stanley Nelson. Stanley kind of saw my reporting over here and he started doing some reporting uh in that area he's actually on the louisiana side of mississippi river and uh, vidalia you know over in that area and so uh he's done some great reporting he was a pulitzer finalist too um and worked on the frank morris case and some other cases so actually uh it's loosely based on on stanley interestingly Greg mentions me in the book, like he has me as like a real life, you know, like mentions me real life character. And then Stanley is, is, is he makes the fictional character. So <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions, so I will uh, let you go. I'll thank you once again for this program. Well, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, for you the guys for uh, reading well. the book and I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it was a great, me. great book. Uh, um, and thanks to everyone for attending. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.